Hello everyone, my name is Amelia Griffith and I'm going to talk about how maize nodal roots grow and avoid drying out in very dry soil. Most of you already know that extended drought will lower crop yields. There are different levels of drought and the difference in crop yield between a moderate drought and an exceptional drought is a loss of 20% of global crops like wheat, soy, maize, um, which is pretty significant. And here is an example of the United States in 2012, where there was a major drought that caused serious damages costing $14 billion. This means that crops that are able to maintain their yield under these drought conditions are in high demand. Maize has two root systems, the seminal and the nodal. The seminal roots emerge first, growing from the seed along with the primary or the radical root. The nodal root emerges second in whorls from the stem. These roots take up most of the water and the nutrients from the mature plant and they provide most of the stability. When soil dries, it dries from the surface down. This means that the newly emerging nodal roots need to grow through very dry upper levels of soil to reach the water deeper into the ground. Plants that are better able to do this will be more likely to maintain growth under drought conditions. In order to do this, uh, plants must transport the water from the stem base down to the nodal roots to the nodal root tip meristems. Um, in order to study this mechanism, we used a divided root chamber system on which the um, seedlings are first placed in the cone of an inner chamber, which is shown in the photo here on the left. And this chamber is full of well-watered soil. Um, and this is where the primary and the seminal roots will grow. We then grow and or build an outer chamber around the inner chamber, which is um, in the picture on the right. And that's filled with a pre-mixed and measured dry soil of either water potentials of minus 0.9 or minus two megapascals. And this is where the nodal roots will grow. And these studies, we compared two maize genotypes, FR697 and B73. After 17 days, we measured the nodal root length of each genotype for each of the three treatments. We found that FR697 maintains its root elongation rates from minus 0.9 to minus 2, and by about 60% from the well water conditions to the very dry conditions. B73 maintains some of the root nodal elongation, but not as well as FR697. B73 only maintains 37% of elongation rates in the very dry so minus two soil compared to the well watered soil. We also measured the nodal root water potentials to understand the root, the water status of the growth zone in each of the treatments and compare the genotypes. FR697 maintains the high nodal root growth zone water potential and does not significantly dry out in the dry soil compared to B73. B73 does not maintain its nodal root growth zone water potential and instead dries out somewhat in the minus two megapascal soil. These results suggest that FR697 has a greater ability to avoid dehydration in its roots growing in very dry soil because it's able to maintain its growth zone water status and continue elongation into the dry soil to reach the wetter soil below, and it's able to maintain the plant stability as it grows. This could be due to mechanisms that allow better movement of water to the nodal root meristem regions or a mechanism preventing loss of water from the root to the soil, or both. Um, so we're in the process of doing transcriptome and anatomical analyses to better understand this phenomena. Once this knowledge is known, it can be used to improve water uptake and usage under water limiting conditions and increase crop yield. And I'd like to thank everyone in the SHARP lab that makes my research possible. Thank you for this opportunity to share my research with all of you. Hi, my name is Jed Groh. 
I'll be talking about the nitrogen and spacing requirements that we came up with for the new advanced potato chipping selections here at NDSU. Pretty big on potato chips up here. And we're coming down the breeding line with a couple new promising selections. It takes about 10 to 15 years to breed a new potato. It's pretty intensive genetic work because it's a tetraploid, so you have all different copies. Each seed is genetically different from the cross that you made. So you have to, when you do find a cross that you, you like, you have to asexually propagate it until you have enough seed to actually uh, mark it. So it, it takes a lot of work. Of the varieties we have released in the past 20 years, only 2% of the total potatoes being planted in North Dakota are actually our varieties. And the past 40 years, it's about 10%. So it's a little better with some older varieties, but they're just not being adopted. Like all this hard work isn't really going to flourish. And so we, we tried to maybe do some experiments and, and, and talk to some people about why that is. Some people say climate, uh, pests, you know, you often breed into resistance into your new potatoes, market shifts. But we really want to focus on this last one. It's the new genetics equals new agronomic requirements. Dakota Pearl here, for example, you can see a picture was a great potato. It needed a little less nitrogen. And if you put too much nitrogen on it, then it wouldn't chip well, it, it turned out black. And that's what a lot of growers did, was put too much fertilizer on it because they grew it out like they grew out their old cultivars. And you see that a lot, you know, there's not really a shift um, of management practices with these newer varieties and, and they don't perform as well. So we're releasing 779C-1, which has beautiful chipping color and ND7519, which also has really good chipping color. They both yield great. And they both can are cold chippers. They can be chipped right out of the field. They don't need to be stored. So with this potential, we, we really wanted to make sure that they were going to be successful. So we wanted to get down exactly how well they performed, what nitrogen, what spacing you needed to use to make sure that they would be successful for the growers. So that's really what we're testing. Hopefully, they would be as successful in the hypothesis we were testing as Dakota Pearl, which is your industry standard. So we were out in Hoople, North Dakota. We used three different spacing, 6, 9, and 12 inch. And we did four different nitrogen rates. Um, people use anywhere from 160 to 200, depending on what they grew the year previously. So quite a bit of nitrogen. It is dry land. So year was a random factor because you're going to get different moistures over year, right? And it all depends because they're not irrigated. So um, we talk about marketable yield and total yield. Marketable yield is the yield that you can actually make into potato chips and total yield that might be too big or too small, but it's factored in. Any 779C-1 was significantly different to Dakota Pro. So it yielded less at the six inch spacing and the 12 inch spacing. Nine inch spacing was similar, although both of those were less compared to the Dakota Pro six and the 12 inch spacings. So it does yield a little less. However, um, it wasn't too far off. It was about 50 hundred weight. So it's in the ballpark, but it was less. 7519 was a little less too. Uh, the six and the 12 inch spacing was statistically similar, but that nine inch spacing, you did um, see less compared to the six and 12 again. So overall you're yielding okay, but you are a little less. Nitrogen was actually not significant at all in this experiment. And th this was huge. Uh, what we realized is, is you can cut back your nitrogen by like 170 pounds in some cases in the fields that they're actually using. Here, we, we proved that you could cut back at least 120 pounds per acre and that's going to save you a lot of money and you're still going to get about the same amount of yield. So then we wanted to see how well these potatoes chip. So ND779C-1 straight out of the field had lower sugar values so they chip a little better. After six months of storage you start to see a rise in those sugars whereas your Dakota Pro could last eight months but it couldn't be chipped right out of the field. It had too high sugar levels so you needed to store that one first. So overall they, they performed pretty well. 7519 we only had one year of data for it, but it shows similar trends. So we did find that as long as you grow these out at the right within row spacing, probably the six or the 12, you're gonna yield about the same and you can chip them right out of the field. You can use a lot less nitrogen, um, about $70 an acre less when it comes to money, which is about $86,000. And you're still gonna get the same amount of yield. So we're, we always talk about this new green revolution and all of these new genetic advances, but if the growers aren't using them, if you, if you can't figure out how to adapt it to their own circumstances, then all of it's going to go to waste. So this was the project and we hope that these cultivars can be successful for our markets around here. Hello everyone, my name is 
Leticia, and I'm going to talk with you about my and my co-author's research, whose end partition in a historical set of Brazilian Soybean cultures. Currently, Soybean is one of the main sources of protein and oil for human consumption, animal feed, fuel as biodiesel, and industrial products. Today, the major producers of this crop are United States, Brazil, and Argentina. In Brazil, soybean is the most important crop, and in the 2019-2020 growing season, produced 124 million tons of soybean. The nitrogen partition in the soybean root system is often overlooked of estimated with little data reported. This is because the root system is difficult to evaluate because many roots are lost in the soil and it's often underestimated. The objective of this study was to evaluate the root and partition in a historical set of 25 Brazilian soybean cultures in different growth stages under controlled environment. The study was carried out in pot experiments under irrigation and open sunlight in a randomized block designed with four replicates. The substrate used was vermiculite and sent in 2 for 1 ratio. Destructive analysis was conducted at the pollen growth stage. Four triplicates before full blooming, R1, and grain filling, R5, where the entire plants were separated into a proper ground and below ground biomass, and to determine to tau N in both parts. Plant parts were weighted and ground to determine to tau N through the spectroscopic temperature method with selectivity group. The root and partition was determined Based on the radio of total N accumulation in the plant and the accumulation in the root. The nodules were not taken into, uh, into this account. Over the phenological stages evaluation, the root N partition reduces from 4 to 48 growth stage V4 to beginning of flowering growth stage R5. For all cultures, because in later growth stage plants prioritize above ground growth, especially reproductive growth, there was no trend in the root and partition comparing with the culture year of release within all evaluated growth stage. At all growth stage, there was a difference between culture by analysis of variance. In quarter foliage growth stage, before the root and partition ranged from 21.7% to 44.4%. In beginning of flowering growth stage, it ranged from 11% to 25%. And in the grain filling stage, it ranged from 1.3% to 10.4 percent. Our results clearly show that there is a great genotypic difference between the partition of N to root in soybean cultures. The partition difference has an impact on the N calculation remaining in the soil, and N length estimates may be currently inaccurate due to disregating the genotypic difference in the root partition. The characterization of the root and partition may contribute to future studies that seek to evaluate the N balance considering only the N uptake of above ground biomass. This was my presentation. Thank you to everyone who has followed so far. Bye!
Hi everyone, uh, I am Ankit, pursuing a PhD in plant biotechnology at the University of Agriculture Sciences, Bangalore, Karnataka, India. I am here to give a talk about uh, my MSc research work, uh, entitled uh, Bacterial Expression Studies of Code Protein Gene of Tomatoli Kalmanthili Virus, which was done during the year of uh, 2020 under the guidance of uh, Nagesh and uh, Maya Shadi. So, the Tomatoli Kalmanthili Virus is a, a variant of uh, Tomato leaf curl uh, virus. Uh, it is uh, first reported in tomato in New Delhi, and uh, later it was spread to the uh, other states of the uh, India and other parts of the uh, world. And uh, also, it has uh, a wide host range. Like uh, it is spread to the uh, other species of uh, crops like potato and chili and uh, uh, British family. So, but uh, nowadays it is uh, becoming major concept in the production of the uh, Lupac Tongla, that is Ridge Guard. So, Ridge Guard in India has uh, uh, having an important uh, consumable uh, vegetable. So, uh, but the production is uh, limited uh, because of uh, the uh, uh, disease infection. So, uh, in all parts of the India, uh, it has been reported that 35 to 100 percent disease infection uh, uh, in the Survey areas and also the uh, yield is drastically uh, reduced because of this uh, infection. So, uh, farmers are uh, facing a lot of problems in the cultivation of the red card uh, because of this tomato leaf culling the virus infection. So, now proper uh, management practices are available but, uh, because uh, uh, no chemical uh, uh, chemicals are. Uh, uh, efficient to control the uh, virus and uh, till date no cultivars has uh, shown resistant to uh, tomato leaf curl new daily virus and also non-availability of the early detection methods uh, is also one of the reason uh, for the uh, uh, this, uh, uh, yield reduction so uh, in our uh, research we are trying to uh, develop uh, the early uh, uh, detection methods uh, that is uh, uh, elisa methods to uh, uh, detect the uh, tomato leaf curl new daily virus infection uh, as early as possible. So we have taken the uh, core protein gene uh, from the tomato leaf curl new daily virus, which is of uh, 771 base pair long, uh, from the infected uh, leaf sample we have uh, 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 done PCR amplified and then flown to it 28A, which is a bacterial expression vector. Uh, and we are cloned in between the sac uh, one and hint three enzymes, and then uh, we are all poor expressed in the E. coli uh, BL21 DA3 strain, which is uh, widely known for the uh, expression of the proteins. And for the confirmation of the uh, ex uh, code protein expression, we have uh, done a HTS page analysis. So you can see that uh, in four, fifth, and sixth lane, uh, the prominent band near the 34 kilo delta is uh, confirm the uh, expression of the code protein. So further, uh, we have uh, optimized the condition of the expression and then uh, over expressed in large quantities and purified the proteins uh, uh, using the uh, NA and uh, nickel uh, DA columns. And then we have a uh, purified protein is uh, sent to the uh, uh, for the production of the monoclonal uh, antibodies so our studies uh, our research uh, will uh, help in the development of the immuno diagnostic platform for the efficient and early detection uh, of the infection and also uh, our team is also focusing uh, in the development of transient bridge card uh, development development uh, for the uh, CPMR strategy to obtain resistance uh, to uh, tomato leaf colonial virus. Finally, I would like to uh, thank you or uh, thank uh, to the uh, MI Plant Research Symposium for the uh, giving opportunity to, to share my uh, uh, research uh, and thank you and all.
Hello, my name is Bruna Luz, and I'm a second year PhD student in the Plant, Insect, and Microbial Sciences program at the University of Missouri. My advisor is Dr. Gary Stacy, and my research is aimed at describing new genes involved in the soybean rhizobium interaction. As a brief introduction, legumes such as soybean are able to interact with rhizobia, nitrogen fixing bacteria. The bacteria are housed in root nodules uh, where they fix nitrogen and provide nitrogen to the plant. This is particularly important in agriculture uh, because it reduces the need for nitrogen fertilizer, which is both expensive and polluting. Understanding the molecular mechanisms of this interaction is important to be able to transfer nitrogen fixing capabilities to other crop plants, such as maize, which would make agriculture more sustainable. With this in mind, we used translating ribosome affinity purification or TRAP to find new genes involved in this interaction. We used a cortex specific promoter to drive the expression of flag tap ribosomal proteins. Uh, in this way, we are able to purify RNA that is being translated uh, only in the cortex. We use this uh, with soybean root samples that were inoculated uh, with Brady rhizobium japonicum or mock inoculated. So samples were taken at 48, 72 hours or 96 hours after inoculation. And then RNA-seq uh, was performed. Uh, we described a few upregulated genes, and we decided to focus on 80 genes that were both upregulated up both at the 72 and 96 uh, uh, time point. Uh, with this 80 genes, we use them further for characterization uh, via RNAi knockdown. So soybean transgenic roots uh, with RNAi constructs were made and these plants were inoculated with Brady rhizobium japonicum. Four weeks after inoculation, uh, assessed nodule phenotype. In this case here, I'm showing the number of nodules per root and this is our empty vector control. Uh, we have examples of three genes here that whose nodule numbers were affected. The first one that I'm showing here, GA3BDO, uh, encodes for gibberellin dioxygenase, which is involved in gibberellin biosynthesis. Hormonal regulation of nodulation is complex, and gibberellin is known to play different roles in early and late stages of nodulation. These two other genes that are involved and nodulation and when knocked down uh, lead to higher number of nodules are both transcription factors. Uh, and WORKI and MIB transcription factors are involved in different biological processes, but these specific tr uh, transcription factors haven't been studied specifically in relation to nodulation. So the next steps would be to further investigate how the spatial and temporal activation or expression of these genes uh, affects nodulation. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm open to any questions and feel free to contact me. Here's my email and my lab website. Thank you. Everyone, I'm Darshana Patra. And today I will be discussing about flax or linseed. What is flax? It is an abbreviated form of fiber, lignin, alpha linolenic acid, and an excellent addition to your daily diet. The topic of presentation is revolutionary use of linseed in enhancing nutritional security. It is one of the crops which are being cultivated in India and the states which adopt these crops are mostly concentrated in the central parts of India. As per the statistics, 
With respect to the world, India stands in one of the top growing positions, but with respect to yield and production, it is lagging far behind. So we need to bring a huge revolution for the cultivation of linseed for oil, seeds and fiber. The fiber of this flaxseed plant is used in textile industry, while the oil, which is having omega-3, also with protein, magnesium and vitamins in the seed content, provides multiple health benefits to us. So we need genetic improvement of linseed with respect to its qualitative and yield attributing characters. Specific genotypes are developed for higher oil content and essential antioxidant and metabolites using targeted crop breeding approaches. It must be simultaneously followed by biochemical assessment of ALA that is alpha linolenic acid and unsaturated fatty acid for medicinal aspects and industrial aspects. The morphological and biochemical characterization of linseed. This is a part of my research project where I evaluated, examined, assessed, recorded and analyzed various aspects of linseed. The relevance of this study was due to the non-availability of good genotypes for the local conditions. The farmers were preferring other oil seeds instead of this because of its other uh, marketable profits. The selection of high ALA genotypes was for better market value. And we selected short stature genotypes for seed purposes because the longer ones are for the fiber purpose. The material and methods includes the various aspects of experimental design, plot size, and the number of genotypes that were taken with the list of characters studied and uh, the biochemical analysis, which is the major part of my thesis, where I studied the fatty acid composition, moisture content, protein content, oil content, glucose, and all that. Some statistical analysis also included ANOVA, that is analysis of variance, PCV, GCV, heritability, genetic advanced, CV, and this way the Mahalanobis D square statistic method was done to create clusters, and canonical analysis was done for the estimation of Z1 and Z2 values, which was supplemented to the grouping of Tokers method. The character association was studied with correlation studies using ANCOVA and path analysis which is the cause and effect relation with other characters per se yield. The results of this investigation was found out and we were satisfied with the error variations that range from 1.04 to 15.02. The PCV range for 2% to 28.30%. There was a low difference in GCV and PCV for days to 50% flowering, days to maturity, capsules per plant, thousand seed weight. This traits were governed by genetic factors with minor effect of environment. This is the tabulated form of my experimental findings. There, the heritability was grouped into three parts, high, moderate, and low. Similarly, the genetic advance was grouped, and the character association studies revealed that taste to 50% flowering had positive correlation to taste to maturity seeds per capsule at both phenotypic and genotypic level. The cluster composition had grouped into eight clusters, out of which these 52 genotypes majority of their genotypes in cluster 1 and therefore moving to the unsaturated fatty acid aspect of the biochemical analysis. This is the fatty acid analysis using the gas chromatography studies and uh, we know that the omega 6 to omega 3 ratio should be between 5 is to 1 to 10 is to 1 as per FAO.